Freedom Health Works is the direct primary care accelerator. We help doctors across the country start fresh in direct primary care. With Freedom Health Works, you work with a team, not a checklist. Visit freedomhealthworks.com and together we can achieve true freedom in direct care. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Healthcare Americana. I am your host, Christopher Habig, the CEO and co founder of Freedom Health Works helping to spread all the cheer and all the good uh, sense and all the good medical care that happens in the direct care world. Today's guest is one of our great clients uh, here at Freedom Health Works, Dr. Nicole Escanio out of Omaha, Nebraska. Her practice, Aspire MD, just went live a few months ago. And so we invited her on the show, talk a little bit more about her story, why she decided to make the jump into direct care or really the transition. I hate when People talk about leaps of faith. Uh, it's not that risky uh, whatsoever, but there is some uncertainty to starting any type of new business. So I wanted to invite her on the show, get her story, why she does it, what her frustrations were with the typical health insurance dominated world, and why she left that world to really start taking care of patients the way she knew was best. So Dr. Escanio, welcome to our podcast. Welcome to Healthcare Americana. Thank you. That was a very kind introduction. Um, we do our best here. We do our best here. You really set the stage for the next, uh, you know, half hour or so of this episode. But you know, you've been uh, a great person to work with over the past few months. We got connected last year and um, helped you start your practice there in, in West Omaha, and doing some incredible things. Um, and you're doing some incredible things. So I wanted to start off. Uh, just tell us kind of an update of of what you're seeing in your practice and what people's reactions are when they understand and it finally clicks into what kind of membership medicine free of third-party payers, what it can do for them. Um, so I am a two months in to, you know, being quote unquote live. Um, but I've been talking about it to my patients for what feels like forever. Um, because I started, um, this transition with you guys kind of in, I think maybe June. Mm -hmm. Um, and then gave my notice, you know, a handful of months later, but had three months where I was still with my old position before switching. So those three months were, you know, where my patients found out that I was leaving. They weren't happy about it and wanted to know where I was going. And most of them were like, yeah, I'll just go wherever you're going. But then I had to kind of do the whole, like, let me explain to you what I'm doing. Um, cause people don't really get what it means when you say you're, you're doing direct primary care. So, and I want to make sure that people understood it correctly and didn't think that it was just, you know, the quote unquote concierge medicine for, you know, the rich people. Um, so I feel like I've been talking about it for a long time, but I don't really think people understand the value of it until they're kind of in it. Um, and I actually had a patient tell me that just the other day that he's like, yeah, I tell people about you all the time, but I just don't think that they, that you realize how good of a value it is and what you get from it unless you're there doing it. And he goes on and on about um, this particular patient about the fact that he can just text me. Um, and this was one of my biggest frustrations with, you know, my other practice, which was hospital owned insurance based, you know, kind of your typical, um, typical primary practice or primary care practice. And when patients would call to try to talk to me, um, or try to ask me just a, the simplest of questions, what it took to get from them picking up the phone to them getting their answer is just like absolutely absurd. And this guy, um, you know, he's like, I just, I just text you and you, you answer. And I don't expect you to answer right away, but that it's that simple. It's just that simple. <laughs> and it should be that simple. That's what we hear a lot. And, and tell me if patients kind of tell you this, that say, hey, Dr. Scanio, this seems too good to be true. What's the catch? Yes. Yep. Um, once you have people that, um, I think the biggest roadblock is, you know, having anyone um, or having, having someone who's thinking about it um, get past the idea of paying more on top of their insurance if they have insurance. Um, once you can get over that hump, um, because a lot of times that's a big roadblock. Then once you tell them everything that you can provide, it's kind of like, well, that sounds pretty cheap, actually, like the, what you're charging. Um, so it's like that mix. You either go from like, why would I pay that when I have insurance to, wow, are you sure you're charging enough? <laughs> 
So what do you think that is? You know, I, 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 I have our theories. Uh, I have my theories. We've talked about different types of theories of why people equate health insurance to health care and say, well, I'm, I'm already getting health care because I pay outrageous premiums each month. Where does that come from in the mind of your patients, do you think? Um, probably the same place that it came from when I even thought about healthcare, because even through medical school, um, you know, we would take time and work in the free clinic for people who didn't have insurance. And it was a great resource for these people. Of course, it's certainly a heck of a lot better than nothing. Um, but it was like, oh, you don't have insurance. Well, you go to the free clinic you know, which is kind of like a little bit of a grimy place with a super overworked, you know, advanced practitioner. And There's a psychological barrier to that, right? You go down to yeah. the, the county, uh, the county health department and exactly. But if you, have insurance, you. if you have insurance, well, then, you know, you can go to a regular doctor. Um, and so is it almost, it, we have kind of a chicken or the egg conversation a lot uh, within this industry. You know, is it, physicians thinking that they can only work with insurance-based patients, or is it patients thinking that they can only see a doctor if they have insurance? And I don't think there's a right answer to that. Like we're yeah. just, you know, trying to, trying to come up with some ideas here on, on how these third-party payers did such a great job marketing these uh, kind of the, the quote-unquote necessity of themselves, yeah. when in reality, it's, it's, we don't really need them. It's both. It's, it's definitely both. I saw some Someone said something, um, something I was reading, like however many decades ago, um, physicians um, sold themselves to insurance companies, sold themselves. And since that happened, um, unless, you know, there are dramatic changes, which one of which would, you know, you, you would say is direct primary care, um, it's never going to change because we, we allow it to happen, you know, um, so if that doesn't change, then you're stuck. And coming out of like residency, it sounds like the idea around private practice is almost like an archaic concept. Um, you know, like you can't do private practice these days. Everything's getting scooped up by hospital systems. And um, even my own doctor um, back in my hometown, both of them, you know, voiced their dissatisfaction once their, their little practice got bought up. And they were, they were still insurance-based private practice, but they got, you know, bought up by hospital systems. So it's almost like the idea, even in medical school and residency, is you can't, you really can't do that. You can't, you, you kind of have to join a, a system. Um, and it's terrible. Is that why, is that why you became a doctor to practice like that? <laughs> right. Yeah, no, <laughs> no one does. Um now, I will say in some specialties, it works. In some specialties, it, it's okay and it works. And if you need, you know, if you need some big surgery or, you know, certain, in certain specialties, you can't, you, you're not going to be able to change it. Um, but when it comes to primary care, and by primary care, I mean even like family medicine, internal medicine, um, pediatrics, OBGYN, those are all considered like your kind of, you know, primary care specialties um it it's just it doesn't work and if it if it doesn't change i can't tell you one satisfied physician in primary care in these kind of hospital owned or insurance based systems yeah there's a lot of dissatisfaction out there let me ask you uh, it, this could be kind of a personal question but Knowing what you know from your experience in hospitals before you made your own practice, you know, before you had the entrepreneurial bug kind of kind of bite you and say, I need to go out and strike on my own practice. Would you, if you hopped in a time machine, would you go back to medical school if you had a chance to redo it, not knowing that there's a better way to see patients? Um, yes, for a few reasons. Um, I never had another big interest in anything else besides health. Um, I really liked surgery. I initially started out um, in general surgery um, and I like the hands-on kind of thing, but in general, like my, my interest lied with like health and the body and science and all that kind of stuff. 
And then um, when I was thinking about what I wanted to do, it was like a lot of people told me, um, you know, you'd be such a great nurse because I like to work with people and I like to, you know, I'm, bit, I'm you know, have a, a decent bedside manner. Um, and there's nurses are amazing. Um, but I was like, well, I want to be the doctor. Like, why do I have to, you know, be the nurse? And this why do is I have to, why do I have to be a nurse to have excellent yeah. bedside manner? Right. It's, it's such an interesting concept, right? And it's not disparaging nurses not or anything, the flight, but we hear that not a lot. not the nurses before I like, I'm going to get, you know, hate, hate mail. <laughs> um, but they are amazing and they do, you could not do what we do without them. And they have their own set of things that, you know, that they go into nursing for. But I, I kind of like didn't even think about it. And then I think the next person would tell me like, well, what about a PA? What about a physician's assistant? I was like, why do I have to be a physician's assistant? <laughs> why can't I just be the physician? Um, so I'm also a little bit competitive with myself. So there was a piece of like the health that I was interested in and I'm a little bit competitive and kind of constantly like wanting to, um, to kind of prove myself and then I could do the next thing. It's really interesting that people are equating, and, and this is like proven on national surveys, that there's a lot of patients out there who would rather see uh, nurse practitioners and PAs for primary care because they believe that they are more personable and that their experiences face-to-face -face with a physician have not been oh, humanizing, I guess is the right word for it. You know, they're not treating, doctors aren't treating patients like, you know, people. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and it's funny to kind of say that and I kind of laugh, but, you know, I'm not joking about that. These are actual studies that people do. Um, so it's almost a compliment when people look at you and say, ooh, you, you get along really well with patients. You, you're talking to them. You're taking time with them. You'd be a great nurse practitioner or a PA. Right. But it just goes to illustrate how screwed up our mentality is and, and, and how some of our best and brightest in our communities are being ushered away from being physicians that really can help out so many more people, yep. you know, within their local get, communities. They get such a bad, I think physicians in general, we oftentimes get a really, you know, such a bad rap. Like, People think that we, one, make millions of dollars and two, are just like, that's all we care about um, because we're so quick with people and, you know, we don't listen and we don't give enough time and we constantly are at our computers typing away and all these kind of things. And no one, almost no physician that I've encountered or that I kind of went through training with wants to be doing any of those things. And that's not why any of them or us um, went to medical school. And if you did, and if that is the case, they go into radiology or pathology. You know what I mean? Like they, they kind of self <laughs> out like, oh, I don't really care about actually talking to people. So you go into pathology. Um, and, but everyone else enjoys, you know, the, the human aspect of it and enjoys like, you know, making connections with their patients and making connections with people. But it is such a terrible system that it just like eats you alive and you have to become somebody that doesn't care about those things anymore and is only, you know, focused on the productivity piece, making your, you know, benchmarks that someone else who's not a doctor sets for you because you can't do both things. You can't, you know, make your productivity to where you know that you're going to get your paycheck, um, which isn't anything that great, um, by the way and take really good care of patients at the and and feel fulfilled by that you can't do both you have to pick and people get burnt out was there a time when you're in residency or when you're employed by a hospital system where somebody told you that you were taking too long with a patient oh yes for sure <laughs> and not in residency residency was amazing because um my residency was more outpatient driven. So some family medicine residencies, there's a big inpatient focus, um, but ours was more geared towards outpatient. Mm -hmm. And you start out in your first year and you have like, like two hours <laughs> per patient who comes in to see you. Um, and then once you get to third year, they're trying to prepare you for the real world, right? And, but it's still, um, I think the max we had in a half day was 10, which would be a busy day, but, you had so much time to prepare and your panels are so low. So like you already know this person when you walk in to see them. Um, it's so nothing like, you know, the, the real world. 
Um, so, so med school was one thing. I mean, residency was one thing, but then afterwards, I don't need, I didn't even need anyone to tell me I was taking too long with patients. I, I was told, you know, this is, this is how you, you know, get your benchmark and this is how productive you need to be. And I knew that I wasn't going to stay five hours after the end of the day because I needed, you know, to go get my kids. So I knew when I started to get behind that I was taking too long with my patients. I didn't need anyone to tell me. And then if I didn't make my productivity, then someone comes in and says, you know, sorry, you, you know, we need to make your template. You need to change your template. You need to drop these 30 minutes that you requested to 15 minutes. Um, and we're going to have to adjust this. And, um, and they tell you how to, how to take care of your, your patients. What was the chatter in the physician's lounge when something like that happens? Uh, did you talk about it with colleagues? Did they voice their frustration uh, to oh, yeah. one another? Or did everybody just kind of accept it and move on? It's a mix of um, those providers who I feel like have already um, who've been at it for a long time and are, are definitely burnt out, kind of have given up on um, trying to fight back against the kind of system. So you've got that, those ones who are just looking at retirement. Then you've got the other ones who are like, you know, no, let me see how many I can get in and out the door. Let me see how much of a bonus I can make. And let me get to the 75th percentile here. Um, and let me see people as quick as possible. And the only way you can do that is by just like telling people what they want to hear and, and giving what I would consider to be kind of poor, um, poor care. So you've got assembly those line, the assembly line medical care that it's just like, yeah. that's not in a lot of, a lot of physicians ethos. A lot of people go into medicine and, you know, we always, we've talked about it. it a lot of people don't, a lot of physicians don't look at, at medicine, practicing medicine as a career. It's a calling. Yeah. You want to go care for people. Yeah. Um, I, I'm curious about the impact on patients. And, and I, I doubt that any patient ever heard anybody in the hallway saying, Dr. Scanio, you're taking too long with this person. You got to move on. But I, I, I just kind of put myself in those patient shoes thinking I'm in the hospital or I, there's something wrong with me. I want to make sure that all my questions are asked, give that kind of a peace of mind and that I have somebody reliable to uh, ask all these questions. And they're not just going to say, Oh, we'll see you tomorrow. Hold those questions. I got to move on to a bunch of different people. I mean, I, that has to affect a patient's psychological and kind of mental health while they're <laughs> while they're ill or undergoing some type of treatment. Well, and it kind of automatically is a huge turnoff. And that's why so many um, people out there, I don't think have the um, trust that they should, should have in the medical system because they can't even come in to their doctor's appointment and ask the five different questions that have been on your mind because they only have time for two of them. Um, so you automatically have like this distrust. People are like, well, I'm not going to, I'm just going to, you know, not go in or not, not reach out when I need something small because it's kind of a, you know, I have to wait first of all, um, in the waiting room and then I get pulled back. And then once the doctor finally sees me, you know, it's, it's just a negative experience all around. And what I did when I started, once I gave my notice um, and people would be upset, you know, and they would say, well, why are you leaving? And I would explain the way I wanted to take care of patients. And I put the blame on, you know, the hospital system or the, the insurance companies. And I'm like this, if, if I could take care of, you know, patients the way I want to take care of them here at, you know, the clinic I'm at, I would do it. I wouldn't need to leave, mm -hmm. but I can't. So I kind of just made it no one could be mad at, at that point, you know, like you just can't do it. And patients don't realize, they really don't. This is the biggest thing is people do not realize how bad their primary care is or how much better it could be. And it's not the fault of the physician most of the time. Yeah. So expand on that because you've been a big proponent of you know, this is what people normally think of primary care, but this is what it could be. This is something out here that you know, is a, is a realizable dream for people. And we hear a lot that people say, well, well, you know, Chris, tell me what you do for a living. And I tell them about Freedom Health Works. And I tell them about all the great people that we work with and the impact that, you know, doctors like yourself are able to make. And then they say, 
well, I have great insurance, so I don't think I need that. What's your response to people like that who think that they get this free, I'm using air quotes right there for everybody listening, uh, free preventive physical or free preventive visit once a year and think that, hey, I'm getting a great deal. Oh, it's just, it's terrible. Um, so like how much time, I guess I would say, how much time do you have? Um, <laughs> well, now I'm curious about this answer. So take what you need. <laughs> well, the, that's like one of the, one of the toughest things was that there's a bunch of patients who only want to see their doctor once a year because they know that in order to get the most, and I'll say cheapest premiums, that they're not cheap. They're still really, really, really expensive in order to get the lowest premiums so that they can actually like, you know, afford it and still continue to buy groceries. They have to usually opt for the like high deductible plans. And that means, as you know, you have to spend a heck of a lot of money before they're going to start covering anything mm -hmm. outside of that one visit a year. So patients come for that one visit with their laundry list of problems and questions that they've built up sometimes for the past year. And that annual covered wellness visit really doesn't cover any of that. Mm -hmm. You know, so they think they're coming in, I'm going to spend all, I'm going to talk to my doctor about everything, get all these questions answered. It's going to be covered. I'm not going to have to pay anything else. I'm going to get my labs done. And then I don't need to see them again until next year, hopefully. And then I won't have to, you know, deal with my deductible. So well, let me let me let me jump in right there because I think that's an important point worth emphasizing is that when someone comes into your office and, and you're an insurance based practice or you're working for a hospital and they say, "Hey, Dr. Escanio, uh, I'm here for my free preventive visit, but oh by the way, I have pain in my chest. I have this. I have this. I have this." You're looking at them saying, "If you utter another word, you're going to have a huge medical bill coming your way." Like none of this stuff is actually in the fine print of this visit. It's that exact situation where they're here. Oh, here! Like I loved it when I would walk in and I'd be like, "Hi, so and so. Um, so you're here for your physical today. Um, let me just start. Are there any other concerns that you have?" And 99 times out of 100, they would give me other concerns. But once in a while, get that person who is like no, I'm good. Things are good. And it would just be like the clouds are parting and, you know, you're not going to get behind. And this is just like a dream. No, and no, let, me, let me, let me follow that up because now you, now you got me on a roll too. <laughs> that one person out of a hundred, now that you're in a DPC practice, are you looking back and saying, you know, I probably should have asked another follow-up question because even oh. though I think that that 1% special where everything's cool, should no. I have dug a little deeper? Oh, uh, I know it's nothing. No one's perfect. So I'm not perfect. No, no one is perfect. So if you really dig into like, well, let's really talk about your diet. Like, no, everyone has a vice. Everyone has something that's bad for them. Everyone. So even the person who thinks they're the healthiest they possibly are, like something is not right. We can, we can improve something. We can work on something, but I am not digging for that when I only have, you know, 10 more minutes with this person and 25 other patients to see I am I am not like you know trying to overturn that rock <laughs> not at all um, get out of here yeah no I get the it other end, if you walk in for someone who's there for their physical and you ask if there's anything else they wanted to get addressed and they say oh yeah hang on a second and they pull out their list that they have actually written and that is like one of those situations where you just like part of your soul dies because you know you're about to hear everything, which is fine if you have time, but if you don't have time, then it is like, that is the hardest thing, the hardest thing for primary care doctors, I think. Um, so going back to, going back to those 99 people that had something else yeah. that they unwittingly, you know, didn't know uh, that they couldn't ask about in a preventive physical, yeah. what was the process? What was your experience at that point? So I was good in my residency, we learned billing. Um, and I knew that like, I wanna be compensated for the work that I do. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure that I'm like billing appropriately. And someone told me it's just as um, incorrect to underbill than it is to overbill. So, you know, uh -huh. you, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't overcharge somebody for stuff that you didn't do, but you also shouldn't undercharge, you know, you need to bill appropriately. Mm -hmm. So like, 
we learn billing and how, because you otherwise can't, if you're not going to be sustainable, right? So if you're going to work with insurance, you have to know how to bill, you have to know what they cover, you have to know how to get your reimbursements from them. Um, so I knew that. And I would tell people, you know, so just so you know, your insurance only covers preventative stuff here. And that's us talking about, you know, your colonoscopy, your mammograms, your, you know, screening lab work, your diet, exercise, you know, that kind of stuff. It doesn't include anything about changing your blood pressure medication. It doesn't include anything about the cough you're telling me you have. It does not include that spot on your skin that we might want to take off. And it certainly doesn't include, you know, the 45 minutes you need to spend talking about your depression, you know? So that's going to all have to come under a, um, a separate visit bill. I'm, I, and then I would always, I would never tell people like, with all those different issues, they had to come back for all of them. I would just say that's going to be covered separately, just so you know, because I learned quickly that patients who thought they were getting everything covered, who then get a bill, get real pissed. Um, yeah, so, rightfully so. Yeah, exactly. Right. So I learned that to tell them up front, like I'm happy to work on addressing as much of this as we possibly can today. Just understand that like this issue, this issue, and this issue is going to have to be billed separately because it just doesn't fall under preventative care. And I put it, I put the blame all on the insurance companies. Do you think that um, you were one of the few physicians who did that? Do you think there's a lot of doctors out there who refuse to even look at the financial aspects of the care they're providing? Yes and no. I think some, I think it's probably a mix because mm -hmm. some people are very attuned to billing because they want to get their RVs up and make a lot of money. Some people are attuned to it because they know that they need to make a certain productivity in order to just like, you know, meet the status quo, which is kind of like me. I, I wanted, I needed to make sure that like my numbers were fine or else the hospital system was going to come at me and tell me I needed to add on another half day, you know? So I needed to like bill correctly, but then other people, there's some people in the office that I was in that just like, just build the same thing for every single patient, right? Cause they, they didn't want to get bogged down with that which I sure. get, totally get. And, and they don't, didn't want to have to learn, you know, about that kind of stuff, but that doctor had to work even harder, you know, to make, make up for it. Um, so I think it's a mix. Looking at your practice and, and you've been seeing patients in your uh, Aspire MD practice for the past couple of months here, you have to talk about pricing with people. Is that, something that you never thought you would do? Or I guess a better way to ask that is how many people used to ask about the price of your care before you started your own practice versus after? Honestly, probably the same. Um, and the reason why I say that is I would be in the same, you know, annual physical appointment with a patient talking about their labs. And I'll say, you know, these are the four labs that your insurance decided are covered for your annual screening. So these are the labs that you're not going to get an extra bill for. And I didn't decide that they did. They're, they're, they're good. They're going to give us some good information, but they're not complete. In my mind, I would, I would like to get X, Y, Z, you know, on top of that, because that's going to give us a much more thorough look into, you know, whatever it might be. That's going to make, give us a much more comprehensive look at like how to really take care of you and prevent chronic disease or whatever. But insurance is not going to cover it. They're not going to, they're not going to cover it. And they're going to put some arbitrary price on it. It's not going to be like a, you know, the cheap cash price. It's going to be whatever random price they decide. So patient, let's just talk about even a vitamin D. Like insurance is really not covering this vitamin D. I think it's important for us to check. Well, okay. So if I have to pay for it, how much is it? Hmm. I have no idea is my response. And then at first they're just kind of like, we don't know. And I'm like, every plan is different. Every insurance has a different price. And we're, you're not going to know until we've already done it. And four weeks later, you get a bill for it. And at that point, it's too late to go back and take back the vitamin D. Right. So you're just going to have to pay it or else you're going to go to collections. <laughs> so they would ask me this stuff and I would be like, so like, I don't know, it's whatever risk you want to take, or you can go home and call your insurance, which that sounds absolutely miserable. Um, Cause then you're going to be on hold for, I don't know how long. And 
probably call the wrong number and, you know, talk to someone who you can't understand. Yeah, and, waste a waste half a day either in the doctor's office lobby uh, in the waiting room or exactly. on the phone with insurance, just trying to find a price. Like, it's going to cost you anywhere from 30 bucks to $180 to get this vitamin D level. And I don't know where it's going to fall. So we would have those conversations a lot. And I would just, at the end of the day, it'd be like, well, let's just get these four labs that we know are going to be covered and leave it at that. And that's what I had to go off of because I wouldn't want that person to get $180 vitamin D level. That's absurd. So now we talk about pricing, but it's in a much more positive light because I kind of can say whether it's the monthly membership. So this is what you have to pay. You can talk to me 12 times a month. You can talk to me twice a month. You can come in, you can not come in, you know, doesn't, it's not going to change anything. You're not going to get another bill for me from me um, if you bother me more than, you know, five times. And then the labs is where I really, the, the best conversations happen because I'll be like, we can do these four labs. Your insurance will cover it. Or we can do cash pricing. These are all the labs I would love to get. It is going to be out of pocket. It's going to be about like, you know, 60 bucks. But it tells us a ton of information. And every single time the person's been like, oh my God, that's fine. Because they're, they're like bracing themselves for me to say like $1,000 or something. Sure. You can see it on their face um and they're like oh yeah that's fine and it's just such an easier conversation and it's transparent there's no surprise like but i might bill you a thousand dollars in four weeks if i feel like it <laughs> it depends what's the price of this lab with, with my insurance well it depends uh I'm sorry <laughs> what and i i always tell people that if there's one thing that americans are good at it's shopping mm -hmm. but yet when most of us walk into that doctor's office, and honestly, it's kind of refreshing to hear that people actually asked you what the price was when you recommended something. And yeah. that sucks that you didn't have any guidance or couldn't yeah. have any guidance for them, yeah. you know, before in your kind of a, like, I'm gonna call it your previous life. Yeah. But that has to be kind of this, this, this mental cloud and the, the kind of mental stress on a physician too, knowing that that question is going to come and knowing that they don't have a good answer for it when you know, it, again, 99 times out of 100, when you're talking to a doctor one-on-one -on -one in a room, the doctor has to have the answers. You're used right. to providing answers oh, to people, yeah. whether it's uh, good news, bad news, somewhere in between. But now the one thing that you can't answer is, well, what? how's this going to impact me financially? And then you quickly see why medical bankruptcy is the number one reason why people, you know, lose their homes and, and, and uh, lose everything. We just forget to ask what the price is, and and mm -hmm. you know that responsibility is on everybody's shoulders. So there's not just one uh, patient or physician or you know goodness gracious. But it's not readily companies. it's not readily accessible. And if that's you, a big if issue. If you're paying ridiculous premiums, which everyone is, if you have insurance, you should be able to click on your insurance app and pull up you know what this price is going to be if you haven't met your deductible yet. It should be very easy. I totally agree with you. And I love the fact that you said, you know, before in the insurance world, people would come in and say, these are the four labs that your insurance company decided that you needed. Yes. That is so powerful right there. And it, it kind of got me thinking. It's like, that is such an interesting word choice, but it is so, so accurate that you have these, this corporation uh, out there, this kind of nameless, faceless uh, group who is deciding what care each individual is going to need based on some math equation. Yep. Not and even be taking effect that we're all a little bit different, right? We all have a little bit exactly. genetic, different genetic code. Like yep. we're all not alike. No one of us is actually, actually the same. And that's the, that was the big thing. I was like, okay, well, so basically the, like the labs that are covered are the things that I want to do, you know, it's a one size fits all kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And if that's your mentality around primary care, then that's, you're never going to get ahead. You're never going to actually, you know, move the dial at all. You're never going to really help people. You're just going to go through the motions forever um, because everyone is different. You know, we have genes playing a role. We have environment playing a role. We've got, um, you know, their finances playing a role. There's so many different things that go into this stuff. And yet every single patient gets the same four labs every, every year. And 
it's not even like these extra things are set at a reasonable price. It's not like, well, it's going to be an extra 10 bucks for us to get these, you know, it's going to be like an extra hundreds of dollars because I don't know who decided that. Mm -hmm. Um, and when you compare it to the cash pricing, you can see right there that it's not because the lab is worth that much. The lab is not worth that much. Right, right. So give us a little bit, you know, kind of take us home here uh, on this episode. Um, you talked a little bit about the price discrepancies and how refreshing it is for you as a physician to be able to say like, yeah, actually, here's the price. And it's <laughs> a tenth of what you what the patient probably thought it was going to be. So um Give us kind of what you would, what your advice is to patients who are frustrated by the system um, and then follow that up by, you know, your advice to physicians who are also dissatisfied with the way that things work right now in the healthcare industry. Yeah. So that's a a loaded question. Um, Nothing easy, nothing, no easy questions on this podcast. No, no easy questions. I would start by, I think one of the biggest things we need to do is allow patients or people out there to realize that what, what primary care should be. Um, Cause what primary care has become in a lot of situations is like a glorified triage. Um, so you come in and your doctor decides, are you like healthy enough for me to just like change your meds and send you home? Or do you need a specialist or do you need me to add on all these labs because, you know, I'm really busy and we'll just check something. So you're kind of like triaged either. Yeah, you're fine. I can handle you or uh, I don't have enough time for this. You need to go see a specialist. Mm. Um, And then mix that with the fact that patients don't want to come in for like for much because they don't want to deal with the co-pays. So patients aren't being seen as often as they probably should. And we're referring to specialists left and right. Um, what your kind of primary care should be is, you know, preventing chronic disease, um, visits where we can really understand your family history, um, in depth and understand, you know, the different things that are going on in your life that impact things like, you know, you're, are you going to develop diabetes? Do you have diabetes? Do you have high blood pressure? Is it because of your diet and you don't realize how bad your diet is because you think it's okay? Or is it because you have all these like, you know, genetic factors working against you and we have to, you know, kind of, instead of doing it this way, do it this way instead, um, you know, then that takes time. You have to really understand the person um, to kind of understand what you need to do to help them. And then you should also be, you know, seeing someone who's, you know, staying up to date on general preventative screening guidelines. This stuff changes. It's not, it's not static you know, it's not the same as it was when I was in residency, even to now. So you want to make sure that, you know, the person has enough time to stay up to date on all the stuff that changes in medicine. And then you should have a thorough exam. You should have, you know, a complete set of labs and and follow up. You should be able to see your doctor several times a year and work towards things. You should be able to fix things, you know, that are wrong with your diet to help you know, instead of just getting stuff, medications thrown at you, um, you should be able to avoid specialists the majority of the time, you know? Um, And I don't think patients realize that that's what their primary care should look like. You should be able to sit down and talk to your doctor for an hour, Hmm. at least. What I'm kind of hearing is, is, is people need, patients need to emphasize, you know, kind of three things, three themes you just touched upon, time, trust, and access. Exactly. Is that fair to say? I don't want to put words <laughs> in your mouth, but you know, yeah. those are, you know, how do we, how do we uh, reduce this to some takeaways for people that say, if you don't have those three things with your primary care physician relationship, you need to find a new doctor. You need to find a new doctor. There you yeah, go. Absolutely. And it's what, not the most of the time, it's not the doctor's fault, but if that's the way that your doctor has to practice, then you need to find a new doctor. And the other flip side of that is really getting into, um, you know, I think residencies and helping them understand, because my residency did give us a little bit of background and training on direct primary care, concierge medicine and and private practice. Um, And that's where I think you're going to make the biggest impact on the the world of primary care going forward, because it is exactly, it is a leap of faith to do this, to do this even... Three years out of residency when I was like, oh, I'm not doing this anymore. 
um, and switch to direct primary care was huge for us, huge. And I could never have done it on my own. So I'm a, be a huge advocate for Freedom Health Works. Everything has been amazing. Um, but it was a big, it was a big deal because we, our income, you know, dropped significantly. That steady paycheck dropped, even though I knew it was going to be short term. We still have to pay our loans back. We have mortgage. We have kids. Um, so it is a huge leap of faith. And then you fast forward to that doctor who's super burnt out, but has been doing it for 15 years. They're just looking forward to the end. You know, they're not wanting to reinvent the wheel and start fresh after they have their practice going. Um, thankfully, some people do, but the majority of them are just, they feel stuck. So I, I, I think it's going to have to come from both the patients realizing that they deserve more from their primary care and then primary care doctors realizing that the hospital systems don't own you. And that's a big takeaway right now is you've already your own person, right? If you want to go out and start private practice, private practice is not dead. It's not extinct. There's people right. out there doing incredible things and, and bringing back that elevated level of care and really providing um, you know, a new definition of the word quality. We always joke that quality to most physicians is whatever the insurance company tells them it is and whatever metrics they have to hit. But to you, it's totally something different. It, it is more personable. It's more value um, and it's more real and it's more yeah. impacting people's lives rather than hitting a bunch of numbers and, and figures on a spreadsheet. Yeah, and that's exactly... That is exactly how I feel. The, the way that I thought primary care was going to be is going to be like impacting someone's life, like helping them, helping them live a healthier life, helping them through something, you know, helping them and their family just be healthier, right? But the reality of it, in my experience, was just hitting marks, seeing enough people, closing your charts, and moving on to the next day. And I didn't even, this is sad, at the, towards the like afternoon, my um, medical assistant would come and be like, oh, remember like John, who you saw this morning, um, who had blah, blah, blah. And I'd be like, no, I don't. <laughs> Hang on a second, let me go back and pull it open. I didn't know the majority of my patient's names. And I couldn't tell you what I did for John in the morning. Um, without going back in and looking at my note. But now I feel like I could write a book about my patients because I feel like I know, sometimes maybe I know a little too much, um, but I know everything about them and I know them by name. Mm -hmm. So it's just it's such well, a, big, go, Dr. a big difference. Dr. Nicole Scania turning patients back into people. You know, I think that's right. one hell of a mission. <laughs> and exactly. one hell of an accomplishment too. So kudos to you. Um, Obviously, you've been a, an absolute delight to work with, and, and, and our professional relationship is fantastic. So, you know, thank you for that. Thank you for trusting our team and our company uh, to be able to help you out and uh, achieve all those things that you wanted to. And, and, you know, we love helping physicians like yourself out, just realize their dream and, and show them that, hey, there is, there is a better way to do this. So we look forward to, uh, you know, following all your success and, and hopefully being a part of it uh, there in the future. But that is going to do it for our episode here uh, on Healthcare Americana. Dr. Scanio, once again, thanks so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thanks, you too. Once again, I am your host, Christopher Habig. For more information on direct primary care, visit freedomhealthworks.com. To check out all of our episodes on this podcast, visit healthcareamericana.com. Thanks for listening. Hi again, everyone. This is Chris. At Healthcare Americana, we're always on the lookout for great stories to tell in the healthcare industry. And we'd like to hear yours. Check out healthcareamericana.com and send us your ideas for episodes or if you'd like to be a guest. Thanks again for listening. Hope you enjoy it.